Hello again, everybody. Uh, thanks for joining us tonight. Um, my talk uh, tries to be an introduction uh, to the insourcing and CQRS. Um, I need to get the videos to the uh, center. So, uh, <coughs> building a couple of applications uh, based on history rather than state. Um, and it tries to show all the principles, the actors, the application flow, and some hints regarding uh, possible implementation, which is obviously in PHP, which is easier this time. The last time I held this talk, it was a uh, not PHP group, so uh, a bit different if you have different language concepts. So uh, it's not doing what it's supposed to, sorry. Okay, I guess I have to get rid of this and use this key. So, <coughs> first we have some definitions. Um, event sourcing versus uh, CQRS. Um, CQRS uh, can be easily implemented without um, event sourcing. But event sourcing uh, can be implemented uh, without CQRS. Because event source models are hard to vary, um, and the hard basically means impossible. Um, I guess we see uh, some of the, the reasons or get some understanding on this later. Um, event sourcing and CQRS versus uh, the main driven design. Um, DDD yeah, can be implemented without ES and uh, CQRS. And ES and CQRS can be used to implement uh, non DDD projects. So it's a they are closely or even tightly related. Very often we have uh, in the DDD project uh, we would have CQRS. Often I'd say um, also event sourcing and then naturally CQRS is used in DDD projects. And um, <coughs> Another important aspect is that um, the implementation uh, is only one part of the uh, DDD. A lot of other concepts and how you work uh, are even more important. And um, this talk yeah, shows event sourcing and CQRS in a DDD environment. I try to avoid too much DDD coupling, um, but it's not always uh, possible, I guess. So, Aggregates in event sourcing, aka ANES, that's uh, what you will quite often read in books and, and blog posts and so on. Um, traditional uh, applications uh, saw the, the state of the aggregates. Aggregates are basically business entities in a database. Um, they often use an ORM, like you know, Doctrine, uh, hopefully too, um, to address the object relational impedance mismatch. And this uh, very often uh, results in compromise in the model, in, in additional complexity of performance degradation. I guess um, some of you have already had these uh, issues. And event source systems, uh, on the other side, store the history of changes in an append-only event store. Uh, you can think of like a transaction log or accounting, uh, where you never would say, some account has a value of something, you just store the changes. <coughs> and then the state of an aggregate, which we obviously uh, will need sometimes, is uh, reconstituted by replaying the history of changes. Um, for the event store, any sort of uh, database can be used. It could be like a persistent key value store like Redis, it could be a specialized one, um, <coughs> like Event Store from uh, Greg Young, which is the, I'd say, the guru of uh, the whole event sourcing stuff. Any relational database can do the job, and <coughs> I think without transactions, it's hard to address concurrency issues. <coughs> then they have some color. <laughs> <laughs> From CKS to CKRS, so CKS is uh, first for command query separation, um, where commands, uh, where it says commands uh, change uh, state but don't return values, and queries uh, only return values but are side effect free. 
and CQRS can one query responsibility segregation on the other side as uh, write models for commands and read models for queries. And um, <coughs> yeah, here I have a little bit of decoupling uh, commands result in domain events that get projected to uh, rebuild or update or whatever the, the new state of a read model. Um, obviously you could also implement that without having the main events with just some, some code that is happening in the same uh, execution space. And then uh, read models are optimized for their clients, um, which are often user interfaces. Um, and they should make any further caching obsolete um, which means, at least from my point of view, read models are serve, serve multiple purposes and one of them is that they are a perfect cache, they are uh, updated when right and, and not by some timeouts or any magic you have to do. So, um, let's have a look at the typical application, application flow in an event sourced uh, application. Um, <coughs> the ports of our application are probably I should point here. Uh, a RESTful API and a message queuing system, typically. Um, ports um, is borrowed from a DDD concept uh, named hexagonal architecture. It simply means it's where the data flow uh, comes in and comes out. So something like a database is, is a different concept. So this is really how you can talk to the system or the, talk, uh, the system can talk to the, to the outside world. So it starts with a controller um, creating a command. <coughs> What's a command? It's a container for the payload um, that yeah, represents the, the request to change. It should be immutable, and should means basically it must be immutable. If you make it mutable, then yeah, that's a big fail. I mean, don't want on the way your command travels any any part of the application to change it. It can be versioned. Um, obviously, you, you very often have to have different uh, versions of an API, so you need to version basically everything. And here we have some, some little example. Um, <coughs> I've done the quite some of the examples in, in JSON basically. Uh, and not in PHP code because I wanted to be uh, language agnostic. So it's simply a container that has uh, a couple of fields, an ID, a username, a password, an email address. Um, obviously, we also need to, uh, to to get access to this data. So in, in a typical PHP application, you would have some getter methods and obviously one or multiple uh, constructor or factory methods. Uh, to build the command. Yeah, then it passes um, this command um, to an application service that should handle it. What's that? Application service command handler. So um, I put the both I put both names because um, application service is a is a DD concept. Um, it's an entry point for different parts of an application. You can basically how you slice it. It's uh, a design decision. Um, for example, a customer registration service, which obviously only handles registering customers. And one application can have, as mentioned, uh, many of them, but doesn't have to. And a command handler is a CQRS concept. It's yeah, responsible, as the name say, uh, says, to handle commands, so to apply the business behavior to the that, that is uh, hidden or that is built into the command request and one application also can have many. So in our applications at least it's always the same. It's, it's one application service is also a command handler if it's for the for the command side basically. And uh, both uh, should hold the transaction boundaries so in the command handling um, any number of, of aggregates can be changed and you want to be uh, want this to be atomic so you need some sort of transaction and that's in the beginning I mentioned that um, you should have 
the possibility for transactions. So if you use Redis, for example, for the event store, it could get a bit tricky. <coughs> Next step, um, <coughs> the application service would uh, create an empty aggregate. This is basically our imp implementation. You can also do it differently. Um, but what's an aggregate, after all? It's a composition of, of business entities, a tree, basically. It has um, a root entity uh, called aggregate root. Now, these are, again, uh, DDD terms, um, just to mention it. It uh, should hold almost all the business logic. Um, there might be <coughs> pieces where you have to let some sort of business logic travel out of the of an aggregate root, but you should avoid that uh, if it's possible. And the manipulation of uh, state should only happen through the aggregate root. Um, plus, its internals should be uh, private. So this is the tell and ask principle. Um, so you have yeah to control where where business logic happens and not give parts of the aggregate to the outside and manipulate it, which um, with event sourcing would not um, work anyways because you have no way to persist the change you have done to an internal of an aggregate. Then our application service has to talk to an event store. <coughs> and what's that? Yeah, as mentioned, uh, some sort of database or other storage. It must be append only, not um, by the principle of the system. As I said, any relation in the database can do the job, just implementation must be append only. It should offer uh, transactions, also mentioned. Um, it should support concurrency handling. And it contains uh, some sort of serialized uh, domain events. Per aggregate, in the order which they have happened, at least you need to, to request, uh, to be able to request them in the order they have happened. And in, it can contain uh, additional metadata, some examples, um, the aggregate ID, a stream version, an event type, if, or event name, when it has, be, has occurred, if it's a snapshot, uh, if it was already dispatched, um, we'll see some of these uh, this, uh, things later. Um, so then the travel goes on. Um, yeah, it, it gets uh, from the event store, it gets the history of the aggregate, the so-called event screen. What's that? <coughs> All the main events uh, for one aggregate instance plus the screen version. If you would leave the DDD space, obviously uh, we would not have the main events, we would just call it changes or transactions or whatever you want. In the order in which they have happened, already mentioned. It can be in a PHP implementation or in any implementation, some sort of list array collection, whatever that's named. It should contain some logic, uh, like creating the next stream ID. This should be stream version, sorry, I missed that part. Um, as it's built of the main events, let's have a look at them a bit more closer. Um, the main event is something that has happened in the past, um, and more DDD-ish again, and is of interest for the main expert. It should be immutable and should again means must, same as for commands, if you can change them on the way, on, on their travel, then you will have funny effects. They will be typically published asynchronously uh, via some messaging infrastructure like RabbitMQ in some serialized format. We do it in JSON, by the way, which is not the, the most efficient, but it's human readable, so um, it's also of advantage if you can have a look at your event stream at your events and, and understand them. If you use a PHP serializer, it's a bit hard to translate to human brain. <coughs> Interested consumers uh, subscribe, subscribe to domain events uh, in a, in a pub-sub way. And again, we have an example. Um, it looks very similar to the command. At least the, the lower part is basically the same because it's a registered event, so it has a 
the full payload. Um, in our implementations, we have an inline envelope which has some metadata like a message ID, which is obviously a UUID, um, a timestamp when this event has been created or happened, is the proper term, and an event name. And here we can have a look at the sample assembly event stream. Um, we would have a customer was registered. I still have stream ID here again, sorry, it should be stream version. Um, next stream version would be a password was changed event. And then we would have a customer username um, was changed. And then this poor guy eventually is removed and his history. So now that we have the event stream, we replay it finally to reconstitute uh, the state of the aggregate. Replaying events, what's that? So the white ones are the events, the black ones are is the state. Is that readable? I guess it's too small for you guys back there. So um, I can't even read it myself. <laughs> we have a customer was registered and obviously the, the state is the same as the payload of the event then we would have a customer password was changed which surprisingly only changes the password then we would have a username was changed which surprisingly only changes the username and then when the poor guy is removed, we see a very small payload because we only need the ID of the, of the aggregate that is removed and we only um, need to set um, some deleted or removed flag. I left the rest of the payload out uh, that might still be there. In such a case, it might still be, or it might also be obfuscated or removed uh, depending on the business logic if you want to have still some sort of access to data of deleted customers. So now we have the aggregate in its current state and we can apply the behavior from the commands payload. So important part, um, behavior or business rules should be separated um, from state change because otherwise you will have uh, funky side effects. Um, the popular example is for example, when you register a customer and you send him an email and every time you replay your event stream, you send the customer an email that it was registered, I think you would be very surprised. Um, they should be idempotent, so if you do the same thing twice, it doesn't change anything. Um, <coughs> there are some exceptions um, to the rule, or it's also depending on a bit on business rules um, or business decisions. For example, you might want to throw an error if, if something happens um, that makes no sense. So if um, a customer in our example was already removed and you still again try to remove it, you might say, okay, we, we do this either potentially and just ignore it, or you might want to deliver an, an exception to the, to the client eventually. Yes, state changes then are done <coughs> by consuming new domain events internally. So we have some code. Again, probably too small. <coughs> Who can read it? <coughs> so this this has only the, the relevant or the interesting parts of, of this code. Um, <coughs> We would have a, a change, so the business method we have is to change password, which would uh, only receive a new password. The business rule basically, use this. so the business, the business rule is yeah, to compare it with the old password, and if it's, uh, if it's the same, nothing happens. Uh, if it's not the same, then we apply this domain event. Applying does always basically two things. First, store the event to the changes of the aggregate. Um, here it's done with a simple array. It can also be some collection list, whatever. And then um, <coughs> we mutate the state. Um, and the mutate basically 
this is again one implementation with a switch case um, as we don't have um, method overloading in, in PHP. Um, <coughs> it just uh, dispatches the event to another method, which is this one. I removed the other methods. methods. And the customer uh, password was changed, you would obviously simply set the password to the new password. Um, and then we're basically done. <coughs> And then the application service um, <coughs> needs to request uh, the main events that this behavior has changed. So um, it can append it, um, those new events to the event store and commit a transaction. There are, <coughs> again, other possible implementations. I, I think, for example, with uh, Greg, Young, com Greg Young's company's event store, they do it internally of the event store and also do the transaction handling. But this is basically the principle that the flow that happens. When the business behavior was applied successfully, you store this change and um, have a transaction around it. And if everything uh, works, yeah, you have basically fully applied your, your behavior. Size my window, probably I can read more of that. So, yeah, some words about transaction boundaries. Um, <coughs> I just show all of this because um, it's a bit unprecise. Um, I just described the truth. So, you need to start the transaction basically just before you apply the, the business behavior. Um, and you need to commit the transaction, obviously, um, after you have applied the, the behavior. Um, in our implementation, everything is a bit, bit different because we do this, um, we do this um, handling loop where we also do retrying. Um, the retrying has a uh, following background. Um, <clears throat> it could happen that when you read the event stream from your event store and before you have fully applied uh, the behavior, then some other process um, changes your event stream. So your business logic inside of the code will have probably have made a wrong decision. That's why you have to throw an exception, a concurrency exception or whatever, and obviously you don't in most cases, don't simply want to give up, you want to retry it because the business logic might still, after you have the, the current state, might still successfully be applied. So that's why we do some, some retrying. Um, we have some, some max retry count set to something. Um, <coughs> that's obviously a decision uh, you need to make how often you want to retry it. And then, <coughs> If after any amount of retries it was not successfully, you would give up, give up, and um, throw the exception again. There is uh, one piece that is also missing here. Obviously, when um, a different exception happens uh, than a concurrency exception, you also uh, want to roll back uh, the the transaction. So I missed that bit, but we have added it now. Okay, and uh, the last thing the application service has to do is to notify an event dispatcher about the changes. <coughs> it won't work. I'm oh, sorry. Yeah, the event dispatcher could read um, those new events from an event store. That's one possibility. Um, and dispatch them to a message publisher and then the message publisher um, publishes those new events to a message queue like Revit queue already mentioned um, and mark them as dispatched that was one of these optional flags you could have in the event store if an event is already dispatched and an alternative approach um, this is what we currently or have in our current implementations that the events um, can be sent along directly to any dispatch message. 
that's why we we had this get changes from from the events to, uh, from the aggregate. So the the dispatcher or it can directly be dispatched to the to the dispatcher um, and not using the event store for, for this part. Um, I try to compare um, this direct dispatching versus collected uh, dispatching. On direct dispatching um, we have simple code but it's bad if, if the publishing fails you need additional logging probably for this because you want definitely you want to know if your um, publishing fails and you want to have some possibility to retry it. And on collected dispatching in an event store, if publishing fails, it's easy to retry. You already have stored it in, in the proper way. Um, you have a built-in publishing log, um, so you don't have to add additional logging. But you have more complicated code and a possible chicken and egg problem because um, you need to decide when you um, <coughs> when you publish or dispatch uh, the message. Will you first send it to, let's say, a revenue queue, or will you first mark it as dispatch in, in the event store? Um, this is mostly a theoretical problem because um, if you only mark it as uh, dispatch, if your yeah, publishing to Rabbit was, was successful. Um, and then let's say your database connection drops and you can't mark it as dispatch. The worst thing you can do is uh, to dispatch it again. And um, event consumption has many things um, should be either potent. So if the same event is published twice, it should not cause any wrong state in your system. So I personally would now uh, go for collected dispatching, probably, with the event store. Yeah, then um, we have a, a domain event as a, as a message on the queue, and some consumer, message consumer, will read the new event or events from the queue, and hands them over uh, to an event listener, which will project the changes into a read model. So this is one slide I have not uh, <coughs> sliced into s to single parts. Um, a little look at an example implementation of a read model. Um, <coughs> that's what we currently do. We use PostgreSQL uh, with a JSONB column that's storing the data. So the domain event. Um, we have an additional primary ID. Um, in a re regular relational field, e.g. customer ID or aggregate ID. Um, yeah, the, the big advantage with, with um, JSON or JSONB and, and Postgres is that you can also index, um, put secondary indexes um, onto any field in the, in the JSON so you can effect, uh, efficiently uh, query them. Um, Postgres 9.5, which uh, recently came out, also um, supports updating directly into JSON fields, um, so you can have atomic updates. Um, before Postgres 9.5, you have to uh, update the full column, so you have to read, modify, write, which can cause um, yeah, concurrency problems when you have yeah, multiple things that want to change the, the same um, read model uh, column. Um, one of the big advantages is that any REST, GET call or whatever, can be answered by a simple SQL query because you already have JSON, so we don't need to do serialization here. Can be delivered as is. Um, but obviously, a list of objects can be a bit tricky. If you have, um, if you don't store your objects in an array in JSON already, which is also probably a bad idea for performance reasons and complexity. So you would have single, single rows for, for objects and you want to build a list, then you either can um, deserialize them and push them onto an array and serialize it again, which is a little can to your performance. Um, <coughs> we do another trick uh, which is called string manipulation, so we just concatenate the JSON strings and put uh, square brackets in front and end of it. 
works very well. But not everybody might like this. <laughs> so, um, now our read model has um, updated data when a client sends a, a query. The controller will ask another application service um, to get the requested data from the read model and return a DTO, which the controller will use to build uh, the client response, which in the way I showed is quite easy. Um, What's well, a DTO, data transfer object, another DDD term. Um, <clears throat> yeah, that's what you want to deliver to the UI or other parts of the system, or the application. Um, I would really not create an object for DTOs. And yeah, seriously, I would not do that. And with the, again, with the approach I, I just showed, it would be totally useless. We already have JSON that we can, can deliver. But putting that into DTO objects is just total overhead and overkill. So use JSON or XML or whatever suits the need of the client. And yeah, for sure, um, we can have multiple read models. Um, we, yeah, you typically will have, depending on the size of the system, as they uh, should be optimized for the specific use case of the client. Um, a bit hard to go into detail here. You might have simple read models that basically are just some sort of materialization of the state of your aggregate, but you might also have read models that get events from different parts of the systems and build more complicated read models um, that are on the other side very optimized for the read case. Um, and then, yeah, this is, this is one of the core concepts. Uh, basically our CQRS to, to separate or to segregate the, the both, both things so you can optimize write and read side for, for the use cases. Yeah, we have the read models live. Another question, yeah, I was thinking about that quite a lot. There is no ultimate answer. You have the freedom of choice. Um, it can be in the same application as the write model. This is what I think typically makes sense for these simple read models that only are a materialization of the state of the right model. Um, <clears throat> that's what it said here. Or they can be in, in some standalone uh, application and then you can call that microservice as you can call basically everything microservice and then you're totally state of the art. Correct. Yeah, that often makes sense for more specialized read models. Um, <coughs> this is something we are, we are um, currently uh, working on for DriveNow, where we have um, in the DriveNow app, you see the available cars for, for a city to reserve some. Um, <coughs> and this will get updates from at least consume different events, and, and um, there it's really far away from from just being some material as state of a right model. It's aggregating uh, data from different sources, so we just can deliver uh, very easy to consume JSON containing all the necessary data to the, to the applications and to the website. So, <clears throat> I'm so fast. That's the end of the journey already. No, not, not completely, only the journey uh, through our application. Obviously, I want to show again or to emphasize on the on the advantages of event sourcing. We have a built-in audit log. Um, <coughs> this is why uh, typically applications in, in industries like finance or banking are built exactly that way. Um, you can exactly see what has happened, when it has happened, and why is your aggregate in the state or your data in the state that it is, why does the customer not have the amount of money on his account as he should have, for example. Yeah, you can look back in history, you can easily um, query the event store um, for events up to some timestamp, from the beginning of history up to some timestamp. Um, if you omit the beginning of the history, probably it makes not a lot of sense. You would have some strange state. 
And you can use that for debugging um, <coughs> by simply stepping through uh, the events and, and see how they change the state of your aggregate and, and find debugging the system. And in most cases, um, depending on, on your landscape of programming languages and everything, only one implementation of an event store is necessary. So we are doing everything in, in everything relevant in PHP. We have some small microservices in, in Node, um, but they don't basically have a state. So every event store is the same. You can give it a, a, a table name for every aggregate. That's what we do. So. <clears throat> We don't have an easy possibility to, for example, to replay um, the, whole, the full history of our complete system. Um, but we can, yeah, it's, it's a distracted model, it's decoupled, we don't couple on one database implementation. Um, we have smaller tables. Um, and after all, if you say microservices, you need to do this because otherwise nobody will buy that you're doing microservices. So, yeah, need them. Um, so that's very, very um, nice. I mean, otherwise you have to do, yeah, create tables or ORM configurations or whatever for any right model. A lot of work, and also do migrations if you need to do changes and so on. Yeah, <coughs> we have no ORM, so because there is no OR impedance mismatch, um, it's. Norm in most cases, way easier to change or refactor an aggregate because no database migrations are necessary in most cases unless you change the capabilities of your event store, for example. And there are also examples where refactoring aggregates is still a bit more complicated when you basically have wrong boundaries, so stuff that is in one aggregate turns out it should be in a different aggregate, then it gets a bit more tricky. But I think that's also quite easily addressable. It's easy to fix things, and in this case with uh, things I mean uh, uh, an invalid state, you simply do correction events. Um, <coughs> this is again auditable. You would just probably, you, you name those events even correction events, you, have some tooling to check them to the event store and then you can see even two years later why something is in a, in a certain state because somebody thought or probably really found a bug, a wrong state, he has injected a correction event, you can even add some operator, user, whatever ID so you even know who put one million euros on the, on the bank account of somebody um, if that's the problem. So, very nice feature. Um, it's also easy to undo things. Um, that's called retroactive events. Um, basically, undoing is a bit different from, from correction, or retroactive is a bit different from correction. Typically, stuff like what we already saw, um, deleting or removing, or whatever you call it, a customer is retroactive because first you created him and then you do the opposite, so for your system it doesn't exist anymore. Yeah, and another nice uh, thing, you can redispatch all the events um, to update read models or even build new read models. Um, you don't have to do funky database extraction, migration, magic. You simply replay the events, you can quite easily do it in a way that when you use Rabbit, for example, they are only consumed by the queue that is there for a new read model or for the wrong read model that you have to, to fix. And then, yeah, quite easily your read model is in, in the correct state or your new read model is, is in the correct state. <coughs> and it enforces encapsulation with the tell and ask principle. As I said, um, even if you let entities leak out of your aggregates and you manipulate them, you can. This won't be persisted. So you have no way of, of somebody accidentally doing this. 
At least it will not work. You will be surprised probably why it's not persistent. And <clears throat> something I also like very much, it enforces um, behavioral thinking like in BDD because the only thing you see from the outside for an event source aggregate and you can also, the only thing you can test with with uh, unit tests or any sort of test is the behavior because you cannot query your um, aggregate for its state it won't tell you there is no getter to get the state um, the behavior is you apply a command and the outcome is events happen so this is just behavior that's the only thing you can test and obviously if you want to find out if your aggregate has behaved in the right way you need to do a test where you send a command that manipulates the state and then with another command you, you test if it's behaving right. Again, you only test if it's behaving right. So for example, if I say the command is delete customer and then I say delete customer again, the expected outcome could be if this is not even pretend that an exception happens because it's not possible. Or if I change the password to foobar and I change the password to foobar again, nothing happens, no event is emitted. So really only behavior. And I really love this. Um, probably it's a matter of taste. And most people will not be so used to this. So <laughs> there are no challenges. Let's do <laughs> that. Okay. Yeah, performance with, uh, with big event streams is typically one of the first questions that people who are new or first time um, think about or read about um, event sourcing. Um, yeah, obviously if you have a high volatile environment and you're applying whatever, 100 commands or 1000 commands to um, an aggregate per day or per second, you will have a very big event stream and the replaying will take uh, ages, especially in PHP. <laughs> we are a bit slower than the other guys, but hey, snapshots to the rescue. Snapshots can solve this problem. Um, <clears throat> how snapshotting is done is, again, a design decision. I, I'm just implementing snapshotting um, in a way that a snapshot is also an event in the event stream. Um, which is marked as a snapshot, so the event store will only load the latest snapshot and then all the events that have happened after that. This can be a bit ugly if you have aggregates that are very big and aggregates are basically meant to be very big. So you can have huge events, um, but it's again, or this is mostly an implementation problem. On the other hand, if you do it the other way and you uh, introduce a dedicated database and model and so on for the snapshots. So again, a real persistent uh, thing like the traditional style. This aggregate and the table and so on will also be very complicated. Uh, and you have another thing in your system and you have something where you might want uh, have to do uh, database migrations. So I like the event approach uh, better. Let's see. If it works in the future, yeah, filters, um, for example. As we said, it's a bit hard to, to query um, event source aggregates because um, there is nothing you can say where username foobar. Um, yeah, you need to find some, some solution uh, for this. Um, and here you can use specialized models um, with some sort of synchronous projection. So, one example I have implemented is um, a use a, in this customer thingy wingy is a username uniqueness. Obviously, you don't want um, to have duplicate usernames in your system. So, this model with the synchronous projection simply, in the easiest case, only needs one field username. And you can, yeah, you have different ways to implement it, yet, but you can use this model to find out if this username already exists. Um, so this is 
definitely something you need to add on top. But I guess you won't have, uh, in most models, you won't have a lot of this stuff. Um, yeah, here is the example. How did applications, so the other example was filters, like find multiple, find multiple aggregates to change them. Did application, yeah, same answer. Um, more stuff needs to be implemented. Um, I'm not even sure if that's true. It seems so. Um, as I said, the event store is a one-time implementation. Um, and this database prep is always, or very often, the most complicated and, and error-prone stuff and makes the most problems. Also, um, it's more stuff, very probably, but every piece is, is simple and specialized and well-known. So I think if most developers, if they have done one um, event source uh, model, they will know everything to do the next one in half the time or, or even faster. The concepts are really not so complicated if you, if you have understood them. Then some people say, uh, for simple CRUD applications, you should not use event sourcing. But it's CRUD today, and it's a big ball, ball of mud tomorrow. We all know that. We'll start with a simple CRUD, and then business comes, we need this, we need this, we need this, and two years later, it's a big ball of mud. So, I tend to set the margin for when I use event sourcing very, very low. Um, if you're not totally sure, it will never get more complicated, then probably you should also go for that. Okay, thank you for, for your attention. Um, as I said, I, I work for Sixth for DriveNow, we are implementing DriveNow. Um, we are hiring, surprise, <laughs> <laughs> applications you can pass to HR. Um, this picture shows me and my pair programming partner, so she's in the driver's seat, you can see that here, I'm the brain. Um, okay, I'm almost in time. Thanks a lot for your attention. I don't have the questions, like <laughs> questions. using the RabbitMQ as one of the ways to transfer messages, right? Yeah. But RabbitMQ yes. doesn't ensure the order of messages coming. And then you will have problems with order of events, right? Um, I think it assures um, the order, in, in the order you put it in, you get it out. Yeah. Even if it doesn't do that. And we typically have multiple consumers for performance reasons. So then definitely you have, don't have a guarantee for order. But I probably don't get the quote from Matthias Marais, uh, one of our great DDD guys, um, right? There are only three problems in, yeah. You know, you know the, the original joke, so the, two, the real two problems are order of delivery and um, duplicate message delivery. Um, this is definitely something you need to address in your projections to your models. Definitely. You can never ever trust your infrastructure or the source systems not to send duplicate events or to have them in, to consume them at least in the right order. So you need to do whatever, how, uh, depends on how complicated the model is, you can have easy solutions where you simply ignore the same event type for the same aggregate if it's older than the less consumed so you sort of need to lock this but that's trivial you can ignore a message with an ID you have already seen and for some more complicated models you um, probably need some sort of state machine that only enables possible state transitions you might also have if you get an event that doesn't make sense you might have to sort of put it somewhere to Redispatch it, which is a bit tricky with Rabbit, but this is just one implementation. So, short answer, yes, and you have to address this. But this is a typical event, uh, real model projection problem you always have to address. Um, I have a question regarding the snapshots that you're planning to implement. Um, what if now um, you need a different change on a state that needs to be 
uh, affecting things that uh, you have already in the snapshot. Can you simply do that? Um, you would not put a correction event in the middle of an event stream, but always in the end. So you always correct the state as it, the wrong state as it is now to the right state. Okay, so you take the snapshot, you apply whatever uh, else needs to be applied, and the correction will then happen and change the right. Thing. Exactly. Either the correction is already materialized in the in the snapshot, or it happens after the snapshot, but it doesn't matter. How do you handle the deployment of new read models with huge event streams? So let's imagine that you have, I don't know, 100 million users and you need to introduce a new read model such as username verification, so to speak, and you have some time where you need to replay everything while being online and maybe new users are being added. How do you handle that? So do you mean um, do that while the Live system is still happening and new event events are happening. Yeah. Or yeah. Ju just a time component because it takes some time. So you introduce username validation at some point, mm -hmm. okay? And you have a lot of users. So how do you deploy the new read model while the system is still putting data into what it's supposed to be a new read model? Yeah, probably username validation is not such a good example unless I understand it wrong because it's a concern of the right model of the, the event source the right model basically so um, if you only at some point in time apply that what happened before did you have an invalid application um, for for this stuff that I've shown in the end uh, basically what what you can do because you can't query um, right models there might be some trickier solutions. Generally, you have a system that is already in production. It, it has huge event streams. You implement a new read model. What you could do is um, you set up a RabbitMQ queue that is consumed by the new read model. Um, you don't start a consumer. You replay the events from the event store so they get into the queue and then you start the consumers for this migration queue and for the live queue that is constantly getting filled. So then when you, all your protections are right, um, you can get your read model into the proper state even if your live system is, is going on and everything events. Thank you.